Hi, my name is Gordon Hughes. I'm a principal at Davies Coles and Cave Law, uh, based in its Melbourne office, and I'm going to talk to you about privacy issues that are, uh, that are surrounding the launch of the Commonwealth Government's contact tracing app known as COVID Safe. Um, now, today is the, it's Friday, the 1st of May. The app was launched earlier in the week on Sunday the 26th of April. Parliament doesn't sit uh, until uh, the 12th of May. Uh, when Parliament does sit, it may legislate to address some of the concerns and ambiguities that currently exist uh, in relation to privacy issues underpinning the use of the app. But until that legislation appears, until Parliament resumes, uh, we will have to live with some uncertainties. That's what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk a little bit about the background to the launch of this app. I'm going to look at um, Australia's privacy framework, uh, so far as it's relevant to issues um, raised by the app. Then we'll look specifically at what those issues are, uh, and then we'll talk about um, how the app addresses those issues and whether it does so comprehensively or not. Now, by way of background, um, as we all know by now, contact tracing is the process whereby uh, health authorities can track down people who've come into contact uh, with a person who's been found to be suffering an infectious illness such as COVID-19. Now, the response by medical authorities to engage in contact tracing is not new. Um, that response is about as old as pandemics are. But what is new is uh, the technology which enhances that process and, and makes it more efficient. In the context of COVID-19, there have been uh, some significant innovations across the world uh, in the use of contact tracing technology. Um, it first emerged in um, this year in South Korea, and then Taiwan, and then China, uh, and then Singapore, which uh, introduced its own app known as Trace Together. And the Singapore app is significant because that's the one that the Australian app is modelled on. Um, now, the Singapore app uh, uses um, Bluetooth to exchange proximity information not location information. It doesn't tell anyone where you've been. It just identifies uh, in an encrypted way who you've been in contact with for a period of 15 minutes or more. Um, that contact information is stored in encrypted form um, for 21 days on a rolling basis and it's deleted. Uh, and what happens is if, if a person is found to suffering from the virus, um, the authorities can uh, upload a list of, of these anonymised IDs uh, and then they have means of tracking down who those individuals are and alerting them to the fact that they need to get tested. The experience in Singapore has been uh, a 25% voluntary take-up of the app. So, how things progressed in Australia. The initiative, uh, the app was only foreshadowed as recently as 16th of April by the Prime Minister when he announced that we would be adopting the Singapore model for this app. Uh, he announced initially a 40% target. Uh, subsequently, he's made a bit of pains to make it clear that 40% isn't a magic number. It's, it's an aspirational number, uh, but he goes on to say that any take-up is better than no take-up. 40% would really make the exercise worthwhile and effective. Uh, the Prime Minister caused a bit of a stir initially uh, when the initiative was announced. Uh, when questioned on a radio interview, he said that he wouldn't rule out making use of the app mandatory uh, if the voluntary take-up was insufficient, and that got uh, 
raise a number of privacy concerns. Uh, but it should be emphasised that subsequently, the, next, the very next day, he treated on that and said um, there were no plans to ever consider making use of the app mandatory. And that's where things currently sit officially at present. Now, if we don't look at the privacy issues, we first need to just have a very brief understanding of the, of the privacy framework that exists in Australia, uh, because it's within that framework that, that the adequacy of the privacy controls surrounding the app have to be assessed. And there are a couple of important points to emphasise for those of you who aren't familiar with Australia's privacy. Regime. Uh, Australia has no Bill of Rights. Um, it's an issue that comes up occasionally. If we had a Bill of Rights, and if that Bill of Rights uh, acknowledged that everyone had a right to privacy, then any legislative or administrative action which impinged upon someone's privacy uh, would uh, be invalid and ineffective. But we don't have that. Some countries do. Our courts have also looked at whether uh, there's a common law right to privacy in Australia. Um, the High Court in 2001, in the case of ABC and Lena Gate Meets, uh, hinted, or some of the judges hinted, that there might be scope for recognising a right to privacy in common law. Uh, but that has never, that judgment has never gained legs in that regard. Since then, both the Federal Court and the Superior Courts in two states um, have said on their interpretation of what the High Court said, they weren't saying that a right to privacy exists at common law uh, in Australia. So there's no joy there. Australia has ratified the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Article 17 of the ICCPR states that every individual has a right to privacy. Um, so that's good as far as it goes, but international covenants, international treaties have no effect uh, on Australian domestic law unless they're specifically enacted into Australian law. And that hasn't been the case in relation to the international covenant on civil and political, political rights. So again, um, there's no joy there. However, uh, the Covenant did provide a basis for the Commonwealth Government to enact the Privacy Act in 1988. The Constitution in Australia says nothing about privacy, but it does say that the Federal Parliament can legislate to enact international obligations. And in order to get the Privacy Act up and running in 1988, the Government relied upon external affairs power to implement the right of privacy that's recognised in the ICCPR. That's how we end up with the Privacy Act. And that's where uh, Australia's privacy law effectively now resides. The Privacy Act of 1988 and specifically the 13 uh, Australian privacy principles that appear in Schedule 1 of the Act. Those principles effectively form a charter what you can and can't do with personal information in this country. So getting back to the app and against that background, what are the privacy concerns that have been raised in relation uh, to the launch of COVID Safe? Um, I think they can be grouped into four categories. Um, where will the information be stored? The issue there is if it's going to be stored offshore, if it's going to be um, stored in some uh, insecure database somewhere, then it obviously becomes uh, vulnerable. If it's going to be stored overseas in some jurisdiction that uh, doesn't recognise privacy rights, doesn't have laws as um, substantial as ours, then uh, that could be a problem. Another issue that's been raised uh, regularly is how will the information be used? In other words, uh, the fear of scope creep. 
uh, is the government going to be able to resist using this information they've collected about people's movements uh, and use it for some other, perhaps law enforcement purpose? Um, a third issue, how long will the information be retained? This is a fundamental aspect of privacy law. Uh, the longer you retain information, the more vulnerable it becomes by definition to unauthorised access, but also the more prone it becomes to being used a long way down the track uh, in a totally different context to that which it was collected. And that can result in making incorrect decisions about people based on out-of-date information. So a concern has been raised regularly in relation to uh, this app is how long is it? Is this information going to be retained? How long is the scheme going to run? And that leads on to the fourth point. How long will it run? Should there be a sunset clause, for example, that says uh, after six months the scheme will uh, be reviewed by a parliamentary committee and it will be discontinued unless there's some uh, clear need for it to continue? Those are the issues. That's what the privacy debate has been about. Next, we need to look as well, what does the Privacy Act, in particular those Australian privacy principles that I referred to, what does it say about what government can and can't do with uh, information that it collects from the public? Uh, and on this slide, I summarised the key privacy principles. In one sense, virtually all of the privacy principles are relevant, but these are the, are the key ones in the context of the current discussion. Australian Privacy Principle 3 says uh, information can only be collected by lawful and fair means. What that means is there has to be a legal basis for collecting the information and, it, and the collection can't be surreptitious. People have to know that information is being collected about them. APP 5 says that that's not enough. It says if someone's going to be asked to hand over their personal information, uh, they've got to know why why they're being asked, what's the purpose it's going to be used for. And APP6, which is possibly the most fundamental of all um, the privacy principles, personal information, once lawfully collected, can only be used in connection with that original purpose of collection. APP8 places restrictions on the overseas transfer of personal information. It's a complicated principle and I won't go into to any detail, but basically it places constraints on the ability to send personal information offshore unless we can be certain that it's going to a jurisdiction which has privacy controls uh, and constraints at least as rigorous as uh, ours. APP 11.1 .1 says that personal information once collected must be kept secure and free from unauthorised access. And uh, APP 11.2 says that as soon as you've finished using the personal information in connection with the reason that it was collected in the first place, it has to be destroyed or de-identified. And so pausing there, when you look at those Australian privacy principles, they already appear to provide quite a reasonable framework to address those concerns that I've already mentioned uh, in relation to how contact tracing data is going to be handled, how it can be handled by the government. So let's look at the rollout of this um, app and how in practice it appears uh, those privacy principles are going to be uh, adhered to. Um, one preliminary comment I should make about the rollout. The rollout is made or is underscored by biosecurity determination and this is a ministerial determination. It has the force of law, it's a statutory instrument but it's not legislation, it's not a statute as such. Now, the power to make that determination which is given to the Minister for Health uh, arises under an emergency declaration that the government made under the Biosecurity Act uh, back in on the 18th of March 2020, and that declaration gives the Minister the power to make uh, 
these determinations, which, as I say, have the force of law. So what does the determination tell us about how the government uh, says it will use, how it won't use uh, contact tracing information? First of all, it's prominently stated that the purpose of the collection is to help conduct, conduct contact tracing. In other words, there's a very precise, specific, limited purpose for which this information is being collected and therefore a limited purpose for which it can be used. Uh, and that statement of purpose is intended to and does address the requirements of APP5 that I referred to, which says people are entitled to know how their information will be handled before they hand it over. The determination says that the use of the app is completely voluntary. It's on an opt-in, opt-out basis. And it talks about how registration information will be stored. Registration information is the static information that you give when you download the app. So it's your name, email address, postcode, and age range. That information will be stored uh, in a cloud-based storage facility. Uh, it will be stored in a secure fashion and the infrastructure will be located within Australia. So this addressing a couple of those uh, privacy principles that I referred to. It's going to be retained in Australia. That avoids problems that would otherwise arise under APP8 with the international transfer of the data. And it's going to be stored in a secure fashion. The determination goes on to say that contact data, so this is the information, not the static registration information, but the contact information about who you've been close to, uh, that will be deleted on a rolling 21-day basis. And all data, including registration data, will be deleted once the pandemic has concluded. And so those uh, those statements in the determination are designed to address APP 11.2, which says that information can't be retained and used um, at any point of time once the original reason for collection has passed. And finally, the determination emphasises that information can be deleted on request. So all of that sounds pretty good. All of that should provide uh, a reasonable measure of reassurance to people who are concerned about the privacy uh, implications of this app. To reiterate, uh, participation is voluntary. There's no forcible collection of personal, uh, personal information. Indeed, it's an offence. It's an offence to uh, require someone, say if you're an employer, it's an offence to require an employee to download Participation is totally voluntary. Um, information can be deleted on request. The purpose of collection is clear. Therefore, the scope is clear and the capacity for scope creep is limited. Storage will be secure and the information won't be transferred offshore to some jurisdiction which uh, has less adequate uh, privacy in the rules than we have. Um, all of that is good. There are some questions which remain, some questions which may or may not be uh, addressed when Parliament reconvenes and enacts legislation which it says it's going to enact to uh, effectively replace the Minister's determination. Um, but one of these concerns that are lingering and which are still causing privacy advocates some angst. Um, no sunset clause. People are concerned that it's unclear how long this is going to last for. The determination says it concludes when the pandemic concludes, but people are, are concerned that that's a rather nebulous concept. And it could be the case that authorities say we should never uh, declare the pandemic is over because it's always going to be lingering out there. Who knows? So some people would like to see the legislation introduce a sunset clause to say that, say, the whole um, scheme will be reviewed after six months and discontinued unless there's a 
overt reason why it should continue. People are concerned about the ability of law enforcement agencies to access personal data uh, under the Telecommunications Assistance and Access Act of 1979. They're specifically concerned about the powers that were introduced into Schedule 5 in December 2018. That gives law enforcement agencies in Australia the ability in the cause of national security to access personal information that's uh, been retained. The government says that's not it's, not, it's, it's not intended that that be allowed. It says it will close that loophole or that gap uh, when it hands down its legislation, uh, but for the time being, that loophole exists. Some people are concerned about the ability of overseas law enforcement agencies to uh, access the information. Uh, under the USA Patriot Act of 2001, US law enforcement agencies can access any US server and extract personal information no matter where that server is located. Uh, the COVID safe information is going to be stored by um, Amazon Web, Web Services, which is a US company, uh, hence it's a US uh, server, uh, and hence, theoretically, US law enforcement agencies have the ability to access that information. Um, that's possibly not as uh, problematic as it may at first sound, because um, Australian Privacy Principle 6.2 says that personal information retained in Australia can only be handed over to a foreign law enforcement agency pursuant to an Australian law, not pursuant to an overseas law. So in fact, um, if a person complied with a request from a US law enforcement agency to hand information over, they would simultaneously be breaching the Australian privacy principle. So possibly that's something that's not going and the final issue of lingering concern to some is that the source code has not been made available. The source code to the software underpinning the app. Um, there was talk before the launch that it would be made available for independent assessment by IT experts uh, for the purpose of determining whether uh, on the independent analysis of the source code or the software contained flaws that rendered the privacy safeguards not as as effective as they said to be. If that hasn't happened as yet, it may well happen in the near future. That's all I'm planning to say at this point. Um, it'll be interesting to see whether some some or all of these issues uh, are addressed when Parliament reconvenes uh, and legislation is passed to replace the determination that currently underpins the scheme. Uh, only time will tell. Thank you.